Tony came to play my local club and um, you know I, I managed to get in the DJ booth with him you know and I'm sure he regretted that night because you know he didn't do one mix or take off one record that I wasn't in his ear what's that give us your phone number blah 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 you know I pestered the guy you know all through his set so anyway you know I, I got his phone number and I, I phoned him this is no joke about you know three or four times a day for you know a good six months you know and he picked the phone up to me every time you know, and I, I look back at that, and I didn't really think of it at the time. But, you know, after being through the DJing, and, you know, I've always sort of tried to help younger people and new producers and stuff, and, you know, it's like, how he didn't get pissed off from me, I don't know. He was just a humble person. And I think, you know, that was one of the things he said to me was, you know, when you're DJing, you know, what he thinks about it is, is you know, always focused on the dance floor and thinking about people, you know, that have been working all week, you know, and they're coming not to be educated, you know, to hear new music, but to, to ha have a party and, and, you know, enjoy why they're there, you know. So, although he, he did, uh, you know, obviously bring a lot of new sounds through, as they all did at Trade, you know, it was never overly sort of trying to be too cool or too clever. and. It's banned, battered about quite a lot now these days that people say, oh, one foot in the DJ booth and one foot in the dance floor. But, you know, from my first experience of, of anyone saying that was Tony, and it came from the early days at Turnmills, I don't know if you're aware, but it used to be in a soundproof DJ booth. And basically, you know, Tony, I first witnessed that, and it was Tony when he made the record, Are You Already? And uh, what he done was, um, because it was all soundproof and there was a door, he had to open to get any reaction. So he would play his records and he would step out onto the dance floor, listen to the reaction, come back into the soundproof thing and, you know, keep on playing. So, you know, that, that sounds battered about a lot and I wonder if that's where it actually does come from. Um, but, you know, as I say, you know, them early days when I first came over as a 16 year old, you know, what an experience, you know, it's like, it was basically, you know, without being cheesy, it was a fairy tale, you know what I mean? Being brought over at that point in time when it was all still pretty fresh and kicking off, you know, scooting up and down the motorway, you know, there were the days when you're doing maybe seven, eight gigs a week as a DJ, you know, you got that sense from him that he actually did care and he was 100%, you know, there for the people that were in the club. We started talking about, you know, when he started DJing and the DMC competitions he used to do. And, you know, he was telling me he used to go with his moustache and, you know, he had someone with him that would whip him when he was DJing. And, you know, he said he was Birmingham's hard luck story. He came second twice and came third once. And, you know, he was saying to me that how much he was enjoying DJing, you know, he was, what, 30, 30, yeah, at the time, you know, and he was saying, you know, I've waited a long time for this, you know, and you could see it in his eyes how much he was enjoying it, you know. One of the main things that I did notice going around the country with Tony, and especially at Trade, was the first time I ever went, you know, it was 100% Muscle Mary's, you know, Raven Lunatic, sort of wall-to-wall -wall man. But that changed, you know, and that was, Tony really brought a, a different feel to the scene and, you know, brought it, brought it, Brought the scene out to everybody, you know what I mean? Brought the scene out of itself, really. You know, it's like, you know, I'm not saying that there was a lot of sort of homophobic stuff going on, but it, that sort of scene, it didn't cross over. You know, there wasn't overly gay people going to Cream or Money Pennies or Sunday Central or anything like that. The same way there wasn't lots of street people going to trade. But, you know, that was something that Tony broke that divide you know what I mean definitely and I think you know a lot of people forget that really and don't really look at that 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 side of things you know if you look at it for the short period of time that Tony was in his heyday was probably five six years you know and look how fast he rose and what he actually done is amazing really when you think about it you know um, and people say, you know, he was just a hard house DJ. Well, you know, he wasn't, you know, 
you know, Tony was playing at Cream, he was playing at Money Pennies, you know, he was playing with Sasha at Chuff Chuff, you know, so to label him with this hard house name is, you know, it's not really, it's just painting a, a part of the picture, you know, a part of the jigsaw puzzle, you know. Um, and the hard house music that Tony played to what most people associate hard house music is totally different, you know. Um, you look at, for instance, the, the, the Global Underground series is, you know, people talk about a sort of hard house as a swear word, but you know, it was Tony that kicked that all off. First Global Underground, Live in Tel Aviv, Global Underground, uh, Live from Tokyo. You know, obviously, um, you know, I was around the sort of latter part of Tony's life as well. And, um, you know, I'm going, still going to gigs with him and stuff. You know, I remember, you know, I would, uh, my girlfriend at the time would sit in the passenger seat with his boyfriend, Andy, who would drive the car. And I would sit in the back with Tony, you know, and it sounds funny, you know, but he was on the medication he was on, you know, he had weird side effects to it. So I would sit in the back of the car and massage his legs. I know that sounds really fruity, like, do you know what I mean? But that's what I would do, and you know Tony was adamant. He was he was still going doing the gigs, and I think it was the last one he done was Miss Money Pennies in Plymouth, where you know he actually collapsed, and you know I always remember you know, uh, Tony you know, he collapsing and he just reaching his hand up and still moving the cross fader over. Do you know what I mean? And that for me is is something that you know some people will think of that as something being made up or sort of myth being created, which, you know, is not, you know, that for me is something that, you know, is, is something that's always sticks out in my head as, you know, a real special moment, but a real sad moment, do you know what I mean, of someone that's, you know, you you can look at them and know how much they have enjoy and what they've done and the time and place that they're in, and ultimately knowing that, you know, this is, coming to an end, you know. Um, so, you know, it was it was um, a very, very, very sweet and sour uh, situation, but, you know, good to be a part of.